Test. Hi everybody, thanks for your patience. Um, so today we'll be studying Douglas Moo's book, A Theology of Paul and His Letters. Um, what I'll do is I'll open it for a word of prayer and then we will watch a video. So the video is, is here. Um, we'll watch the first 10 minutes of it. So the video is an introduction by him of what he writes in the book. And then after the video, we will go into um, sort of my thoughts on it. Okay? Um, so this will be a bit different, um, but bear with me. Um, and then there will be, this series has three lessons. So today's lesson is more of an introduction. The second lesson will be on Paul's specific letters. Um, all 13 of them will go into a bit more detail. And then the, the final lesson will look at um, Paul theology and some of the major themes. So um, it may be something new to some of us. I, I think for me it was quite new. So um, hopefully you know, all of you learned something from it. So maybe I'll open us with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Lord and Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you have given us, for giving us this chance to be here, to worship in your house. We thank you for your house, for your preacher, and uh, your servants who can deliver your word, Lord. We thank you for this time where we can study your word, and we pray that even through looking at the theology of Paul through the lens of Douglas Moo, that we can um, learn the truths that you have for us in your word, to look at some of the key themes, the key influences, and that this will sharpen our minds even as we study your word, Lord. Lord, we pray that um, you, you, you be with us even as we commence this study and in the next two uh, lessons next month um, that you give us eyes to see. Bless everyone who is attending this lesson all this pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'll start with the video. Um, this will be for about 10 plus minutes. Um, just bear in mind some of these um, key concepts and um, what Mu says and we'll go into more detail in the presentation. Welcome to this study of Paul's theology. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as we all know, is one of the great theological thinkers of the entire history of the church. Arguably, his theology and teaching provides uh, one of the most significant foundations for what we believe as Christians. Uh, so it's a joy to explore his teaching, to understand his theology, to try to put it in a context that makes him relevant for our day as well. We're going to try to do that uh, over the course of this video series together. We want to begin with some preliminary uh, issues, what I'm calling approaching Paul's theology. Paul uh, is difficult to get a handle on in many ways, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go in this first uh, session here. Uh, it might be useful to just start with thinking of Pauline theology as a form of what we call these days biblical theology. Now by biblical theology we don't mean theology that's based on or in accordance with the Bible. We mean theology that kind of stays close to the biblical text. In contrast, for instance, to systematic theology that of course also deals with the text but at a little more of a distance, bringing philosophy, the history of discussion and other issues to bear. It's useful maybe to think of Pauline theology then as a form of biblical theology and to see it as forming a connection. So we move from the exegesis of the Pauline epistles where we're dealing with the text in detail. Uh, we're trying to form biblical theology out of that exegesis. And ultimately then the idea is biblical theology becomes the building block for systematic theology application, and other things we might want to do with the theology of the Bible. So Pauline theology plays a central connecting role at that point. In addition to that though, Pauline theology also plays an important connecting role when we're thinking of biblical theology as a whole, because obviously we're looking only at one biblical author. So we might think of Pauline theology as one key building block of the next stage of our work, New Testament theology where we're bringing all of the New Testament authors together and trying to understand them in light of each other. And then ultimately, of course, New Testament theology is integrated with Old Testament theology in a grand biblical theology. Uh, so there are a lot of stages to go through when we're thinking about the theology of Paul and how he informs our thinking, 
uh, both about scripture and about larger theological issues. Now, as I mentioned, getting a handle on Paul's theology is a complicated thing, and we need to talk a little bit about how we plan to do that. Uh, J.C. Becker, uh, last name spelled B-E-K-E-R, in 1980 uh, wrote a book on Paul's theology in which he developed what has become a famous saying uh, about Paul's theology, coherence and contingency. In other words, what we have in the New Testament, as we all know, is not a single Pauline systematic theology. Paul did not ever sit down and write one overarching theology explaining just what he teaches and what he believes. No, what we have, of course, are 13 separate letters from Paul. That's the contingency. In each of the letters, Paul is addressing a particular pastoral situation. Uh, what he says in the letter is determined to a significant extent by the situation of his readers, by the what we call occasional nature of the letter. So that's what we have. That's the data we have to work with. 13 independent letters of Paul written on different occasions, different dates to different audiences dealing with different problems. If, however, we want to do Pauline theology, singular, one Pauline theology, we need to figure some way to develop coherence out of that contingency. That's the key function that Pauline theology uh, forms. That's the key task that we have if we want to build a genuine theology of Paul. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we process that? How do we set up a theology of Paul that deals adequately with both contingency at the same time as it moves toward, in a very authentic way, coherence. So the problem we face again is trying to figure out how do we get coherence out of the contingent letters of Paul. Uh, N.T. Wright, who is a genius at formulating very neat comments about things, puts it like this, trying to describe the landscape of Pauline theology these days. He says, and I quote, trying to describe what was going on in Pauline theology used to be like trying to board a moving train. It is now more like trying to describe a box of fireworks seven seconds after someone has thrown a match in it." Close quotes. Uh, over the many years I have been researching Paul's theology, I can certainly endorse that comment. Uh, trying to get a handle on Paul's theology is quite a challenge. How do we propose to do that? Well, as you look at other people who are studying Paul's theology these days, there are, are several approaches. Uh, one approach is to follow the teaching of each letter. Envisage then a Pauline theology that simply moves seriatim in sequence uh, from Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and so forth, each of the chapters devoted to a letter in which uh, there is an attempt to explain the letter in its context and to draw out what each letter teaches. There's great virtue in that approach because it enables us to stick close to the text and close to the occasional nature of each of the letters. Something we'll be looking at as we move through this course is the way in which uh, Paul's letters can only be understood well as we keep them in their original context and look at the occasion that generated them. So there's great virtue in looking uh, at the teaching of each of the letters in that way, but the problem is equally apparent, I think. You end up with, in a sense, 13 theologies of Paul. Theology of Galatians, theology of Colossians, and so forth, rather than a genuine theology of Paul. So most people studying Paul's theology think that we need somehow to bring all the letters together in conversation with each other. Here again, we find a number of approaches. Uh, one option is to take a single letter as a template, sort of follow its argument, and then integrate the other letters of Paul within that. This is the approach taken by James Dunn in his very fine theology of Paul. He uses Romans as a template, and then again, integrates uh, evidence from the other letters of Paul into the argument of Romans. Again, uh, I think there is value in that approach. It, it, it helps us to ground Paul's theology in a letter he wrote. 
However, it obviously runs the danger of privileging Romans over the other letters of Paul in a way that might, might skew our results at times. Other Pauline theologians take categories from elsewhere. Uh, some uh, kind of uh, unabashedly decide they're going to use categories from systematic theology uh, and use that as a template to describe the theology of Paul. Again, value in that and helps us to move into systematic theology, which is a good thing to be able to do at the end of the day. Again, however, running the risk perhaps of imposing categories on Paul that, that may not quite cohere with his own teaching and ways of thinking. So for me, uh, the, 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 the best approach here is to try to find categories from the letters of Paul not necessarily actual words, because the problem with words is that they are not concepts. Now, maybe I just need to develop that point for a moment, uh, perhaps to make it uh, clear what I mean by that. Uh, Paul uses a word like justify uh, very often in uh, Galatians and Romans especially. He doesn't, however, use the word justify very much in other letters, some of them not at all. So does that mean there is no concept of justification in the other letters of Paul? Not necessarily, because the concept of justification may be gotten at, Paul may refer to it, with other language, you see. So if we use words as our organizing principle, uh, we are going to find ourselves in trouble. We are going to find ourselves unable fully to integrate all of what Paul wants to say about a topic. It's been popular in recent years to focus on narrative as a way of thinking about Paul's theology. In general, uh, as some of you will know, in biblical studies over the last 30 or 40 years, there has been what's called a narrative turn uh, in the way we look at scripture and think about it. A very welcome development in many ways because, after all, very much of Scripture is narrative. Uh, and we need to uh, be, be thinking carefully about how to handle it and how to learn from narratives. Uh, many uh, uh, scholars are, are applying this to the theology of Paul. They, they argue, oh, Paul is working with narratives. My judgment on that claim is uh, twofold uh, and moves in two different directions. On the one hand, it is clear, I think, as you look at the letters of Paul, that he is not writing narratives. That's not sort of what comes across in the letters. Uh, he is arguing. He is logically moving through topics. He is addressing, uh, sometimes in sequence, issues that he knows have arisen in a church. The letters are not organized or structured by narrative. So I think that if we try to uh, argue that the letters of Paul are narratives, we're, we're taking a wrong turn in terms of what the letters actually are. However, I think it is a really good reminder uh, to uh, realize that when Paul does his theology, he always has a narrative in the background. Uh, he's thinking about what God has done in unfolding his plan in history. We'll be talking more about that uh, from Adam to Abraham to Moses the fulfillment in Christ, the history of the church, the culmination of the universe, this grand narrative uh, that moves throughout human history for Paul is an orchestrated plan of God. And he's always thinking in those terms. So narrative in that sense, yes, we, knew, we do need to appreciate it. But to go back to our main issue here, it's not perhaps a very helpful way of organizing Paul's theology. So what, what I'm going to do here is to try to have my cake and eat it too. Therefore, on the one hand, in the first part of the video series, we're going to look at each letter of Paul in sequence, in chronological order, so that we're getting grounded in the actual letters of Paul and uh, paying careful attention to the context and situation in which each letter was written. Then in the second part of the video series, we're going to take a conceptual approach. We're going to look not at the letters on their own, but at the topics that emerge from the letters. And as I will explain a little bit later on, I've chosen the broad category of realm uh, 
uh, as the category we're going to use uh, to sort of uh, organize Paul's theology. Again, I'll say more about that at a later time. Okay, so as you can see, this whole idea of Pauline theology is quite a complicated concept. Um, and it takes a lot of reading and understanding. Uh, I cannot claim to be an expert. So before I begin, uh, I'd like to offer some disclaimers. Very big and bold, because it's important. Okay, so the first disclaimer that I have is that the three CI lessons are my attempt at summarizing and presenting what Mu has written about Paul's theology in his book. So, show of hands, has anyone read the book? Okay. Okay, so no one has read the book. It's about 750 pages, so it's quite a long book. But the CI lessons are presenting and summarizing what he's saying, okay? I'll make it very clear that his views on several issues do not necessarily reflect my personal views or the church's views, right? But I will add that the view, the book rather, is a very useful primer on Pauline theology and worth our study, okay? So that's the first disclaimer. The second disclaimer is that this is not a review of Mu and his views. So I don't plan to drill deep into why does Mu say this in his commentary in Romans? Why does Mu say this in his commentary in Galatians, right? many of these views and issues could take lessons of their own to expound on. So I'm not going to you know, take on various topics and say, oh, Mu says this, but we believe this. This is not what this CI is for. So the second disclaimer. Third, I realize that the title of the CI says like book review, uh, which is a bit misleading because I cannot spend three hours doing a book review, right? So, um, and to quote an actual review written online about this book, it says, Reviewing a book like this is like reviewing the Oxford English Dictionary. There's no way to talk about everything and no one wants that anyway. And I find that 100% true. So I'm presenting what he's saying and in the third lesson, I'll share my own thoughts, right? So what I think about the way the book uh, presents certain things, what I agree with, what I disagree with, and what we can learn. So that'll be in the third lesson. So if you want to fast forward to third lesson, you know, you can just come on third lesson, but otherwise feel free to sit in. And last... Um, again, I feel very compelled to say this, that I do not consider myself an expert on Pauline theology, just someone who has read the book, uh, studied it as best as he can. So um, when it comes to taking questions, uh, you notice that there's no mic there. So what I prefer to do is at the end of the lesson, I'll wait here, I'll sit here for about 10 minutes. If anyone has any questions, uh, I prefer it to be a private discussion. Um, if there are any questions that, you know, I, I'm sure there will be topics that might be relevant and we'll put them in the next lesson. So I'd rather that mode of question and answer um, if that's okay. Okay, so very long disclaimer, but important. So um, with all that being said and done, I would sort of spoil it by saying that I recommend the book. Uh, I think it's a book that is generally quite accessible. I will admit that some of the concepts when you watch his video, some of you, your eyes might glaze over, right? Because it's very, it's very theoretical, some of the ideas, some of the concepts. But I'll try to explain why Paul's theology is important for us. And I think it's especially important because it helps us refine our understanding of the message of Christ, right? Um, so yeah, so, so there are parts of the book, if, you're, if you intend to pick it up, that are rather chim. Um, and you need to reread. Like, I read a page, right? And I don't understand, I have to read it again. And I read it with the, with the references. Um, but Mu as a whole does a good job in tackling something that is just enormous in depth and breadth. Okay, so here's a preview of the three lessons. Okay, so today's lesson, as you can see, we'll look at Douglas Mu himself because if we, we, we are looking at his book, we need to know who he is, right? Um, and then Paul. So I think... The section on Paul is very important. Uh, it may be obvious to some of us, but it's good to know his background, his, his theology, of course, his influences and his letters. So all these are things pertaining to Paul. And I thought we could end off by using Philemon as a case study. So in Mu's book, he has an introduction section, sort of, and then he goes into each of the letters, right? And each of the letters, he breaks it down. So I will use Philemon as a case study to sort of explain how he breaks it down. Um, and, you know, if you all find it interesting, you know, the book is always available for purchase. 
uh, online or in person as well. So um, this is today's lesson. So as you can see, I, I live very day to day. So I have not started the full planning for lesson two and three. But the idea is to do a deep dive into Paul's letters in the second lesson. And that will take quite a lot of time because there's a lot of material. Again, I'm not going to go into specific topics, but more of um, themes per se. And third will be a deeper dive into Paul's theology and a review of the book. So, we'll look at Douglas Moo, right? So, okay, so no one read the book yet, but has anyone read a commentary from Douglas Moo? Okay, maybe have, but shy because someone sent some questions before the CI, so I thought they had read a commentary. But, so, Douglas Moo is a reform scholar. I mean, he would call himself a reform scholar. Um, and is a theologian and emeritus professor at the Wheaton College Graduate School in Wheaton, Illinois. But more importantly, I think, and more interestingly, he's a very prolific commentary writer. So if you've studied the NT in your own Bible studies, you might have come across his commentaries. Um, notable works he has is are on Romans and an introduction to the New Testament with D.A. Carson. So he has written a number of commentaries about... Um, written a number of commentaries about the New Testament in particular. And I was listening to the podcast, I think, this book, The Contract, or something of that sort, was... Um, he, he, he took up the contract to write this book in 2005. And it was published, I think, one or two years ago. So a tremendous amount of work went into this book in particular. And I think what I find interesting is this, this quote. So in his biography online, he says that he has these words on a plug in his office... It says, apply yourself wholly to the text and apply the text wholly to yourself. And that is the way that Douglas Moore approaches uh, the Bible, right? And, and if you look at his videos, if you look at, um, you know, podcast, if you listen to podcasts or whatever he has said, he comes across as a man who's passionate about the Word of God and a man who finds joy specifically in exploring what the Scripture has to say. So I think he said that, you know, he'll make a very lousy pastor because he'll be just be hold up in his room reading and, and, and exploring the Bible rather than socializing and fellowshipping with people. But that's who he is, right? He really enjoys reading the text and expounding on it. Okay, so that's the author. So now a look at Paul. Okay, so I think, again, some of this is quite, I mean, you all know this, but I think it's good to sort of go into a bit of detail. So if you could all turn to Acts chapter 22 on your Bibles, and then I thought we could uh, do a bit of responsive, or rather read together um, Acts 22 verse 1 to 16. Okay. So we can all read together. Acts 22 verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I, now, which I make now unto you. And when they had heard he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous to God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, also as the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem, for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying, unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him which spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go to Damascus, for there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, 
I came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews that dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers have chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that the just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be a witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Verse 16, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, we see that Paul, we, we look at Paul's background. Obviously, we know that he was not called Paul. He was known as Saul, right? And first point that he was a Jew born in Tarsus. So, he was born in Tarsus, an important and cosmopolitan city in the Roman province of Cilicia, right? But, so, so we have this influence of where he was born, right? But interestingly, we look at point two, he studied under Gamaliel, right? So he was trained in the Jewish faith by Gamaliel. And we know that Gamaliel, as per Acts 5 verse 34, was one of the leading rabbis of Paul's day, right? So Paul has this influence, right? He was taught by Gamaliel, he studied under Gamaliel. And I think we're not clear which city uh, 3B refers to, but it's likely, it's possible to be Jerusalem. So maybe Paul moved to Jerusalem at an early age from Tarsus. We don't know for sure. Um, but we can see again this Jewish influence and this will be reflected later as we go into um, a study of Paul's influences. Next, we see that Paul was a zealous persecutor of Christians. So, I, I think one thing that really stood out, if you can remember, Paul calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? I think that was in um, Philippians 3 verse 5. So, he, has this, he had this very pharisaical approach to keeping the law, and we would think that he kept the law to the smallest detail, right? Just as the Pharisees did, right? The law was their grounding, and that was how he lived his life. And lastly, we see, and I think the most important thing here is that he was converted on the road to Damascus. So again, you know, we are all familiar with how he was converted. I'm not going to go into a debate on whether it's a call or a conversion, but we know that Paul's life changed on the road to Damascus. And why is that important? It's important because this was a significant generating force in his theology, right? If he, was, if he wasn't converted, we wouldn't have Paul's theology, right? And so, Mu says that he replaced the Torah with Christ as the center of his intellectual and religious universe. So think of uh, almost like a wheel, right? And now in the center, rather than the law, is Christ, right? That is... Paul's, um, that, that, that was how Paul's life changed. And, and so, if you look at Paul's letters, many of his convictions can be traced back to this particular event, his conversion on the road to Damascus. And, and I put a quote up there, which I thought was interesting, uh, to, to sort of highlight uh, Paul's, he's sort of a man of two worlds. We see, as a believer, Paul is a Jew who no longer remains in Judaism. His ethnicity has not been renounced, but subsume within an identity and allegiance governed by the event of Christ, right? So, Paul is a Jew, but he no longer remains in that religion, right? His ethnicity as a Jew remains, but he has a new identity, that of a Christian, okay? So, that's Paul, and I think we're all pretty clear on who Paul is and, and his life. So, sorry, this has a lot of words. Um, so, just take a couple of moments to sort of look at it. Um, Mu has a very nice table in his book. Uh, I didn't really know how to do a table here, so I just wrote it like that. But um, there, are, there are some things in bold, right? So if you look at what's in bold, um, these are obviously the books, or rather the letters that Paul has written. Um, Mu posits that there are 13 of them. Some scholars would say that you know, there are sev seven or whatever number of key uh, epistles, some, but we will take it as 13 for now. And if you look at the question marks, um, this is because we still don't know for sure, especially for Galatians and for Philippians, exactly when they were written. Okay? But what Mu does is that in order to come up with this chronology, so in his book, he has the events and then he has the references. 
right? So all of these things, the birth has a reference, the being brought up in Jerusalem has a reference, so on and so forth. So he doesn't come out of this from nothing. But he uses X as a, as a guide to the history of Paul's life. So in the book, you will see a column on um, the events, the so-called events, right? A column on X, where you see them in X, and a column on where you see them in the other um, uh, letters, right? And so, we, he, he sort of uses X as a guide, and again, if you read X, you know that Luke is not super clear about chronology, right? He uses phrases like, after many days, and so on and so forth. So, he doesn't say like, okay, after two months, Paul went here, after two years, he went here, right? He's not so precise. But, because Luke and Paul refer, Luke in, his, in X and Paul in his letters refer to enough events and known people from secular history, Mu says that we are able to assign some dates to the key events. Okay, so again, um, if you look at the book, it's a clearer picture of the events, the year, and the references. Okay, so um, again, as I would say, Galatians and Philippians um, are the most uncertain, and that's why they appear here uh, multiple times at possible locations. Um, and, in, and it's quite interesting if you look at um, it in totality, how much of an experience Paul has gone through in his life, and all these lends to um, his theology. Okay, so then the crux of the matter, or the key question, right, is what is pure Paul's theology, because, you know, I, I mean, some people will say, like, why, why, why is this Paul's theology important? Or what's the point, right? Like, Paul is not Christ, right? So why study his theology? What, what's the big deal? And, and some people may even be uncomfortable with the words Pauline theology. So I think what's important is that Mu says that Pauline theology is not just looking at what's in his letters, right? So the common misconception is that, okay, Paul's theology means... I go to a letter of Paul or I go to many letters of Paul and then I read what he has to say and that's it. Whatever he says is Paul's theology. That's not the case. Okay, so it's, that is just an exegesis of what's in the letter, right? So, Mu says that we need to look behind the text and when, when he says behind the text, right, it means that we go beyond the surface, right? We uncover the framework and content of Paul's thinking. Again, that's very, very difficult, right? It's obviously much easier to look at the text and say, Paul talks about justification, Paul talks about leadership, Paul talks about pride, right? But we want to dig deeper. And so, the idea is to move beyond exegesis, describing what's in the text, to form theology by synthesis. And synthesis means putting together the various letters and Paul's thoughts. And so I would say that Paul's theology is a set of Paul's beliefs that lie behind and generate the various teachings found in his letters. Okay? So again, a, a set of Paul's beliefs that lie behind and generate the various teachings found in his letters. So let's, let's be clear that Paul's theology is not something that he just plucks out of thin air. He wakes up today and says, okay, you know, I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about that, right? Paul's set of beliefs is Paul's reflection on the Christ event. And we all know what the Christ event is. The birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, so on and so forth, and the return of Christ, right? That Christ event and that significance of the Christ event was brought home to Paul during his conversion, which is why the road to Damascus is important, right? The Christ event generated Paul's theology. That is the basis of his theology. That's where it comes from, right? It comes from his conversion, and so, I think what Mu says is very important, that when you look at individual letters, they have their own context. Paul is writing to a specific audience in a specific context with a specific message, right? And so we don't look at, I mean, it's, when we look at Paul's theology, rather, you look at all these letters in totality, rather than looking at one letter, let's say Philemon, okay, Paul's theology, we, we, we base it on what he says in Philemon. We can't, because what he says in Philemon is specific to the situation with Onesimus, the, the, the situation with Philemon himself, right? And the message he's trying to bring across, right? So again, there is a variety. And so I think that, that hopefully helps to uh, explain what Paul's theology is, right? It's not just what he says. 
but his thinking, uh, and, and we're going to explore some of the influences behind his thinking because that's important as well. But first, uh, a warning. So, the moment we move behind a text, we introduce a strong measure of subjectivity. That's what Mo says, and I agree with that, that you as a reader or as whoever have your own influences, right? So, this is what he says. I acknowledge that the interpreter of Paul will inevitably bring their own baggage, some of their own baggage into interpretation. I am a North American, white evangelical whose thinking has been strongly influenced by Reformation theology. Biases stemming from my identity are undoubtedly present in this volume. So, he, and, and this is one of the things I love about Mu is that when you read the book, he doesn't just present his, his point of view as the be all and end all, right? He's clear that based on his background, and what he has studied, he has his own biases and he brings, and he will unconsciously or subconsciously bring some of these biases into his own interpretation, right? So, what then is the solution to that? He says, through sympathetic listening to the voices of others, both ancient and modern, and not least the ministry of God's Spirit, as I read and reread Paul, I'm hopeful and not confident that what I claim to find in the text is really in the text. So again, it's, he doesn't just take his point of view and superimpose it, he looks at what other people have to say. So, um, that is hopefully uh, a picture of what Paul's theology is and a warning when it comes to, you know, sort of deciphering the theology. Okay, so what's the center of Paul's theology? Um, I mean, it seems like a dumb question, but man many candidates have been put forward for this role. Uh, what, what, is a central, what is central to Paul's theology? Some say uh, the word of the cross, dying and rising with Christ, salvation, reconciliation, so on and so forth, new creation. And, and so many concepts have been put forth as the center of Paul's theology. But Mu says that in his opinion, union with Christ is what holds the theology together. So what is union with Christ, right? So, Paul expresses this union with Christ in a number of ways. So if you look at point two, Paul uses with to associate Christians with Christ in his redemptive work. What does that mean? So in Paul's letters, he says things like, we die with Christ. We are crucified with Christ. We live now with Christ. We will be raised with Christ. We suffer with Christ, right? So there's a union, right? And he uses the word with um, to associate Christians with Christ in his redemptive work. Another way he uses to highlight the union is the word in, right? And he uses this in virtually every aspect of Christian existence and theology. Examples, to them who are sanctified in Christ. My way of life in Christ. A man in Christ. They were in Christ before I was, so on and so forth. So, Paul's, or rather Mu posits that the center of Paul's theology is the union with Christ, right? And, and so, you know, some may say that, okay, the gospel, right? That is the center of Paul's theology. And, and I, I think that's a valid uh, way of thinking. But Mu says that the gospel acts as an overarching concept. Same with reconciliation and some of these other concepts, right? So union with Christ, he sort of gives the analogy of a, of a web, right? Of a web that holds all the parts of Paul's theology together. Union with Christ, okay? So that's the center of Paul's theology according to him. Okay, and it comes to the sort of interesting part about what influenced Paul and Paul's theology because we want to know what prism Paul is seeing the world through. And so there are a few influences, okay? So again, to quote Mu, he says, reading Paul without a background is impossible and as I noted above, unwise. Paul's words, like anyone else's, are shaped by the various influences on his thinking. It's just like you and I, if we speak, to anybody, right? If we say something, our, our set of beliefs, our set of um, the way we think, the way we act, it's all shaped by influences on our lives, right? And likewise, Paul's theology is shaped by various influences. So what are these influences? I think it's important to look at. First, um, the Old Testament, right? And we see this by looking at what, some of what Paul says. So remember we talked about how Paul earlier was... Um, was taught by Gamaliel, right? So he was a, a Jew, right? He was educated in the Old Testament, right? But obviously, when he was converted, his views changed, right? He, 
the Torah is no longer the center, Christ is the center, right? And so that means that his understanding of the Old Testament obviously will change, right? And there, but it's important to note that his commitment to the authority of the Old Testament remains. So he doesn't say, say, okay, now I'm a Christian, let's discard whatever is the Old Testament, right? Forget about it, it's useless. No, instead, 2 Timothy 3 verse 6, 16, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for t- teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. So the Old Testament is important to him, right? And if you look at Paul's letters, he refers to the Old Testament simply as the scriptures or scripture, right? So there are references to the scripture. And so we see this in Paul's letters through various means that he uses. And I have three here, but they are more listed in the book. The first is explicit references and quotations. So obviously it means referencing the Old Testament. Second, it means, second allusions and third, conceptual influence. So we'll look at each of them. Okay, so explicit references. We see how Paul in his letters refers to people, events, and institutions with reference to the Old Testament. For example, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning. Where does that come from? It comes from Genesis. The promises that were spoken to Abraham and his seed. Where does that come from? Again, Genesis, right? They all pass through the sea. Obviously, the all refers to the Israelites. So again, these are events that come clearly from the Old Testament and shows the Old Testament influence on Paul. Second, he also quotes from the Old Testament. So sometimes he doesn't just say things, he quotes it as well. So if you look at Romans 10 verse 11, as the scripture says, right? You look at Romans 10 verse 20, Isaiah boldly says, right? And, and sometimes he even makes use of language that is well known enough that if you read the letter, you will recognize the source. Okay? So an example would be 1 Corinthians 10 verse 26, right? I'm not going to read it, but it's a reference to Psalms. Okay? So all these are references and quotations that point us to the influence of the Old Testament in Paul's theology. I think that's quite clear. Second is the idea of allusions. So allusions are a bit more complicated, but uh, uh, Moo describes allusions as a, a conscious and deliberate choice of language that is designed to draw a listener or reader's attention to a text or a series of texts, right? So again, a conscious and deliberate choice of language, a, a specific word choice to draw someone's attention to a text. Okay, so let's, let's look at an example. So a good example he gives is the idea of bearing fruit and growing in Colossians, right? The idea of bearing fruit and growing. And we all know that in Genesis, we see the idea of bearing fruit and growing in the creation story where God commands human beings to be fruitful and multiply, right? And so on and so forth. I mean, there are a number of more references, but the, the word choice takes the reader back to the Old Testament, right? And we, and we see that through allusions and echoes of the Old Testament. And lastly, or rather, this is the third point, but there are more in the book, um, con- conceptual influence. So what does that mean, conceptual influence? So again, when, when you want to, the first and best place to look, when we want to unpack the meaning of a key term in Paul, is often the Old Testament, especially the Greek, right? So Mu gives the example of the word hilasteron in Romans 3 verse 25, which means propitiation, right? So, the verse is, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation to faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Right? So, why, what, what has that got to do with conceptual influence? Well, in Leviticus, right, this is an allusion to the atonement cover in the tabernacle, a piece of furniture that figured prominently in the day of atonement ceremony. So again, you look at the word, if you read the word, you know, hey, this thing appeared in the Old Testament. It was this thing that was used in this particular context. And there's a meaning that is similar or carries the same meaning. Okay? So, through its association with the feature of the tabernacle and its prominence to the Day of Atonement, the Word would have communicated to Paul and other Jews the concept of God's atoning work. Okay? So, that's what it means by conceptual influence. So, I think it's pretty clear and undeniable the, the influence of the OT in Paul's theology. Okay, second. Uh, second temple Jewish teaching. So again, uh, this was another term that 
honestly, I wasn't familiar with. Uh, I had to Google what is Second Temple Jewish teaching, but basically, it literally is the Second Temple, right? The, the second, uh, the rebuilding of the temple, right? All the way to the destruction of the temple. So, Paul grew up again with the understanding of scriptures, right? But the understanding was mediated by this teaching. And so, when, when Paul, again, I'm, I'm, I keep going back to this replacement of the worldview, right? So, Moose consistently says that he replaces the Torah with Christ as Son of God, and all scripture must be read in light with their fulfillment in Christ. So, in Jewish salvation history, there were two ages, right? There was the old age and the new age. The old age is the, the age of Israel's subjection and sinfulness. And the new age is their exaltation and abolishment of sin and idolatry. So there's the old age and the new age. But the Bamu says that the revelation of Paul to Christ, or ra- rather the revelation of Christ to Paul, re- requires a revision of this two age salvation history. This is quite a, a this requires a bit of more in depth look, and we will look at that when we look at the themes uh, in lesson three. But basically, the new age had dawned, right? But the old age hasn't disappeared. So there was an overlap of the ages in that point of time. So how do you reconcile that, right? So um, that's where Mu talks about the new realm. If you remember the video, it talks about the new realm and the old realm, right? As a concept. So we'll discuss a bit more of that in the third lesson. But basically, we see the old age and the new age and how these ages overlap, okay? Third, uh, early Christian thinking. So again, if you read, which is why again, it's important to read all of Paul's letters in context to each other because sometimes one letter appears to say something another letter appears to say something else, right? And if you read it by itself, you just take it as it is, you're not going to get the truth, right? So, if you look at what Paul says in Galatians, Galatians 1 verse 12, he says, I did not receive from any man nor was taught of it, rather I received it by revelation from Christ. So, it appears to be saying that Paul received the gospel from Christ. He didn't get it from anybody else, right? So, but then after that, in 1 Corinthians, Paul also says that, he, that the gospel outline of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was something he passed on, was something, something that he passed on was something that he had received, right? And the language of received in those contexts refers to receiving teaching. So how come in one letter Paul says that I got it, or I received it by Christ, and then another letter he says, oh, actually I it seems to say that I receive it from someone else teaching. Well, Mu says that, and, and I think we, I agree, that if we read Paul, we, we should read Paul as claiming that he was taught truth. So again, the second point, he was taught truths about Christ and the gospel by others, but he was convinced of the truth of these matters because he himself had encountered the recent Christ. Okay? So again, all these things, which is why it's important to read the letters together because Paul was taught truths about Christ, but at the same time, he received the truth from Christ, right? And the both, both do not contradict each other. They work together. And so, this early Christian thinking, right, uh, the truths, was an influence in Paul. And last, uh, and, and, and I mean, this seems obvious again, but I, I found it quite interesting, and I don't have the answer for this, but if you look at Paul's teachings, Interestingly, he seldom cites Christ's teaching very explicitly apart from and events in Christ's life as, apart from the death and resurrection, right? But so, so people, I mean, you, you might wonder why and I also wonder why and I don't know the answer to that. But obviously, we, we know that, that there are explicit references to Christ, right? And there are a lot more connections on second look. How, let, let, I'll give a couple of examples, right? 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10, not I but Christ. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 14, the Lord commanded. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23, 26, I received from the Lord, right? So these are just some explicit references. So it cannot be argued that, oh, okay, there's no mention of Christ, no. While he seldom cites it um, explicitly, these are a few of the explicit references. On top of that, right? there are a number of texts that point to Paul's dependence on the teaching of Christ. I'm not going to go into those, but uh, yeah, you, you can look up those for yourself, but there are texts as well, right? Romans, 1 Corinthians, 
1 Thessalonians. So I think the important point that we want to take away is that Paul's teaching stands in continuity with the teaching of Christ. Okay? Paul's teaching does not contradict Christ's teaching. It stands in continuity of it. And I think it's, it's a, the imagery I was given was the teaching of Jesus is woven into Paul's language, right? So it is in there, right? It is, maybe you can think of a, a, a rug, right? Where the different fibers of it, right? It may look like its own thing, but it consists of Christ's influence and teaching. So again, all these are the influences on Paul's theology and I think are, are important as we study the various letters and uh, the various concepts. Okay. So, again, a very important point that, we, that I cannot emphasize enough that what Paul writes in the letters are generated by the circumstances of his readers. In each of the letters, in the second lesson we'll look at, there is a different, um, there's a different point of uh, emphasis that Paul gives. Right? He emphasizes certain things in different letters. Right? And so, um, we always think, we sometimes think of theology as, okay, theology means like this thick book, right? Like someone wrote, a theo- like the theology refers to this book, right? But no, because Paul is a missionary and pastor, he wrote 13 letters, we put these letters together, and we try to make sense of his theology. But at the same time, it is essential that we understand the letters in their own right. So I'm not saying that you discard the individual letters, you ignore the the context, you ignore the, the audience. No. You look at the context of each of the letters, but you synthesize them together. And so, I think, what, uh, one, one thing I want to highlight was that the letter, uh, and this is from Mu, was a recognized form of communication in those times. right? And Paul's letters share generic features with Asian letters. So, interestingly, he says in the book that um, other letters are usually shorter, but Paul's letters some of it can be quite long. I think he says Romans, 7,000 um, words or, or something of that sort. But they are much longer, but they have, uh, ancient letters have a structure, which is the opening, the thanksgiving, the body, and the closing, right? And most of the time, I would say that, or maybe all the time, we can see that in Paul's letters as well, right? Sometimes he doesn't even open much. He just goes straight into the heart of the matter, maybe because it's very important. But there is a general structure to the letters. Um, and, and so, like what Mu says in the video, Paul's theology must develop a coherence from these letters. We put the letters together coherently. Um, I'm not going to go into a debate on how many letters Paul writes because every, you know, different people have different views. right? Some say that, okay, um, the pastoral epistles fall into one category. You know, uh, Paul wrote seven letters. Others are written by you know, other people with reference to Paul. But in his book, Mu says that, or Mu takes the opinion that Paul's theological teaching is from all 13 canonical letters. So when we look at the letters in depth in the next lesson, we will be looking at each of the, okay, because we're looking at Philemon today, so 12, the 12 remaining letters, right? And I thought before we end, to sort of give us a, a teaser of, of how Mu looks at uh, the letters. So obviously, I picked the shortest letter, which is Philemon. Um, and, and so, if you go to Mu's book, right, he has these three um, sort of um, sections uh, for each letter. Okay, so we'll look at Philemon as an example. Um, he usually starts with locating the letter. So, what does locating letter mean? So, my understanding it means that you're trying to put the letter in the trajectory of Paul's mission. So where is the letter? Where along Paul's life is it? Right? Um, not just that. Who is he writing to? Because it's important to know the audience, right? We cannot just assume that it's a generic letter written to everybody. There was a specific audience. So in this case, if you want to locate the letter, right, who is it addressed to? In Philemon, it says, Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, and also to Afia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. This was listed in Philemon, but obviously we know that it's probably the main uh, so-called audience will be Philemon, right? And also, not just who it was written to, but when it was written, right? So, Mu says that, you know, this book may have been written while Paul was in prison, right? So, locating the letter gives it context, right? We want to know who he was writing to, we want to know when he wrote it, and 
we want to know, um, yeah, we, we want to know when it was written. So that's locating the letter. Then we go into isolating the issues. So what does that mean? So Mu will look at, uh, and, and, and Philomena is more straightforward because of the, the length of it, but it's about what is Paul saying? What is the issue, right? What is Paul tackling, right? And in the case of this book, Mu says that a single issue dominates the letter. And the issue is the status and disposition of Onesimus, right? He's wrong Philemon in some way, but Paul wants Philemon to welcome him back, right? So that's the issue that he's trying to address. And, and, and we look at that issue, um, but, you know, we isolate the issue, right? And so the last section, analyzing the argument is a bit more, um, not so self-explanatory, but usually it's a look at how the letter contributes to the theology of Paul, okay? So um, in this case, Mu says that there are two particular ways. One, Paul wants Onesimus, uh, rather Philemon, to receive Onesimus back, and this has implications on slavery. So that's Mu's, that's Mu's understanding, right? One of the... Um, one of the ways. The second way is that he says that this highlights a practice-oriented vision of Christian fellowship, which means that this shows what kind of fe what fellowship should be and how should we practice it, right? So these are just two simple uh, ways or, or rather in which it contributes to the theology of Paul. Um, and so Philemon, or rather Mu uses these three, uh, locating the letter, isolating the issues and analyzing the argument for all the letters, um, and, and we will look at each of the individual letters um, in the second lesson. Obviously, the, when it comes to isolating the issues and analyzing the argument in particular, for the longer letters, it, there's a lot of material. So we'll try to um, focus on some of the key things um, that Mo looks at. So I would just like to end with some final thoughts um, and an emphasis on, you know, the fact that while we are looking at Mu's book on Paul's theology, it's not, um, I mean, he's, he has this quote where he says that many think that Paul's theology has been given too large a role in shaping, shaping our theology as a whole. And we stand in the Reformation tradition, often working, guilty of working implicitly of a canon within the canon, privileging Paul's own way of communicating with the significance of Christ and ignoring other voices. So, my, the point is that we shouldn't ignore other voices at the expense of studying Paul, right? But he also says that my years of studying Paul have convinced me just how much he has to contribute to the vision of Christ. Paul's voice is not the only voice, not even the foundational voice, but an important voice. So as we embark on this study of Mu's book, where he looks at the theology of Paul, I think it's important to have that perspective that while we study Paul's theology, we do not discard other theologies and we recognize the importance um, of Paul's voice. And he says that the goal is a renewed mind. So he says, my prayer for myself over these years of working on Paul is that my study will accomplish a goal that Paul himself sets forth, a renewed mind. It's my prayer that, though, that this will be the effect of those who read this volume. So again, as we you know, study this, I hope that um, a study of Paul's theology will renew our minds, right? As Paul says, and that we will have a better understanding um, of the message of the gospel or the message of, of salvation through Paul's theology. So with that, I will end for today. Again, I will be available for questions if anyone has any questions. Uh, if not, I would hand the time to Elder Lowe to close us with a word of prayer. <laughs> He's smiling. We thank God for uh, Brother Matthew uh, volunteering to do this difficult uh, book review. Uh, I know this topic seems to be, as it's presented, right, as if it's not going to the Bible yet, right? And I know some people uh, like to you know, go into the Bible straight away. But I think uh, it's good that uh, since Paul wrote so many episodes, if we have this big picture perspective, uh, I think when we study, go into the Bible, in our Bible study, hopefully in the centralized Bible study, right, we will have a deeper appreciation of the Word of God. La. So this is a purpose, la, right? So hope that you all can uh, learn and maybe even get the book and read and, know, and find out more, learn more for yourself.
Okay, let's close in prayer. Our dear eternal Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word to us and through your servant Paul, the Apostle Paul, and that heart indeed in, in, in so many of the New Testament's uh, epistles written by your servant, we have learned so many things and that you've revealed so many things to us. We pray that, Lord, we may have a good grasp of it so that, Lord, as we read your word, we may appreciate what a great God you are and who you are and what you have done for us and what Christ has done for us. So, Father, we pray that you bless uh, the continuation of this series of lessons that we are going to learn. We ask and pray all this in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.